to oh, and we're live. Hey everyone, uh, nice. Hugo Van Anderson here. Hey Florian, James, Sebastian. Hi. How is, I'm going to put this on gallery view as well, of course. Uh oh, yep. So we can all. I, I don't see it on YouTube yet. Do you? Well, no. It takes twenty, a 20 second lag. Um, <laughs> so that's that's part of the magic here as as well. Um, so, but we are we are live, and I'd love to welcome everyone. And I can hear myself now. So I'd like to welcome everyone. Um, hi, Jordy. If you if you could introduce yourself in in the chat and let us know what your interest is. Um, if you're interested in supply chain analytics, interested in distributed computing in general, interested in understanding how your milk ends up on 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 your shelf and then in your in your fridge. Uh, th that'd be cool. Um, hit subscribe if you enjoy these these live streams. Um, we're we're doing this from Coiled HQ, which is everywhere. <laughs> we're a distributed company, um, and we uh, we build products for doing da data science at, at scale. So among other things, zero click hosted deployments for for DAS to get your large distributed uh, workloads up and running ASAP. But this isn't this isn't about us today. This is about the wonderful work at uh, blue, blue Yonder. I'll introduce our guests in a second. Um, I'd just like to introduce someone you may have meet, seen here before, James Bourbeau. Um, hi, James. Hey, Hugo. How's it going? Pretty good. Yourself? I'm doing, hanging in there. Doing all right. You are a maintainer and core contributor of Dask. Yes, and software engineer at Coiled. Both of those things. And it looks like it's dark where you are. It is dark. It is 6.03 a.m. Right. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry. I thought it was going to be 7 a.m. for you. I, I feel... No worries. Okay. Um, so, thank you. It's 11 p.m. for me. Um, but our guests in, 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 in the sweet zone in, in the middle, uh, uh, tuning in all the way from Germany. So, Florian and, and Sebastian, maybe you can tell us a bit about what you do and a, a bit about yourselves. Okay. Maybe I start because I'm not so important in this... Uh, in this webinar. So, um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm Sebastian from Blue Yonder. Um, uh, I'm here because I'm, uh, I'm in a role of, of evangelist. So all I do today is to follow all the questions and uh, maybe delete them if, if they are not suitable <laughs> for us. So, <laughs> no, no, just kidding. Fantastic. So I'm just here and I shut up. Great. All right. So, so I'm, I'm Florian. I'm a yeah, data scientist at Blue Yonder and I, well, spent most of my time actually as a data engineer and um, am more or less maintaining distributed for us or Dask in, in general for us at Blue Yonder. We are using it by now at a very large scale. So um, that's uh, quite a significant part of my job by now. Cool. And maybe could you just um, tell us or tell the people who, who aren't aware what, what Blue Yonder does? All right. So Blue Yonder, <clears throat> so one one um, segment we are focusing on today is supply chain management. So we are providing this as a software as a service um, offering. So um, in a nutshell, people submit or customers submit their data to us. We crunch numbers and um, provide them with orders, uh, decisions, so they can essentially um, automate their supply chain management. Um, and this is what we are going to talk about today. Awesome. Um, and I think one of the first times we spoke, I. I professed how excited I am about supply chain analytics in, in, in general, because I think it's actually from the mid 20th century, one of the one of the first really strong use cases for like industrial da data science that that we saw um, and, and solving very, very well, well needed, well needed challenges. Um, so I'd love to hear from you what before we jump into what you're working on, what what Dask is and, and, and what you like about it. So maybe you can define Dask or tell us about your impression of Dask. All right, so, so I think <clears throat> we should start with the Dask core library. Um, that's, uh, I think when I first got in contact with it, it, it looked like say, uh, some, some experiments, so a collection of algorithms on how to parallelize scientific computing. Uh, by now it grew or it still is, but it grew to something um, which can handle out of core data. So, so much, much larger data than I can fit onto a single machine. There is the stars distributed framework, which is, well, it's a scheduler somehow, but much more complex of course with data locality and so on. And in the end, the beauty about it is uh, for me, 
um, I can, you know, implement incredibly complex things on my local notebook and then just, you know, hit submit and it ends up on a cluster with a thousand CPUs. So that's, that's essentially what, what we are using Dask for and that's pretty awesome. And that's what we're going to get some insight into today as well. Yes. So James, as a, as a Dask maintainer and core contributor, how, how, how does that resonate with you? Great answer. Yeah, I'm like super excited to uh, to see how it's uh, how, you, how you guys use Dask. Um, you you said that you use like Dask kind of at scale, sort of. Can you just give a rough estimate of like how large yeah, so, a cluster, how many clusters do you have, that kind of thing? Yeah. So um, that's so so let's start with the, the amount of clusters we have because we have. Of course, a lot of customers, uh, there are say restrictions to data isolation between the customers. So we operate all of them in individual environments. So speak a different cluster. And we have different applications which build on top of each other and they have their own environment. Sometimes there's C++ in it and so on and so forth. So we have a lot of different environments and this all totals to about 700 clusters at the moment. I think about 200 of them are actually you know, production um, use cases and by production I mean they are fully automated so there's no human interaction involved uh, and the others are you know data scientists um, burning CPU and the in individual clusters so we have clusters about maybe 10 workers I think the biggest I see in a production like environment are about five or six hundred uh, workers um, that's about the ballpark so in total we have uh, I think the scale is up and down over the day, but from one and a half to 3,000 um, workers or CPUs active just for distributed. But I also have to say we are still in a migration rollout phase, so I expect this number to probably double by mid and next year. Wow, that's great. That's pretty cool, isn't it? That's some, that's some real scale. Let's jump in. Yeah. Show, show us what, you, sure. what you're up to, what you're into. All right, since uh, Hugo was so excited to um, you know, um, know and, and understand what a supply chain is, I want to start a little bit with uh, introducing the domain we are actually dealing with. Um, so um, the supply chain, I told you, okay, how do you get the milk you can buy? And, and this of course starts with a store. In this example, I, I just shown a very small and overly simplified graph on how something like this looks like. So you have, for instance, these stores, I picked three locations in Germany where you can actually buy stuff. And the problem is now, okay, how you, how to get the milk there and how to ensure the milk is there when you want to buy them, but not too much milk because then you need to throw it away. So you need to find the sweet spot. And this already hints at two problems. First, we need to know what the demand is. Uh, this turns out to be a huge machine learning problem. And then of course, if we know what the demand is, what is it we need to order? Because you know we need to take into account that there is something in stock um, uh, the supply chain has a certain lag, there are distribution centers involved and so on. So this optimization problem is then a huge network and this is just a small glimpse of it. So think of this, you have a network of, of distribution centers and um, you can of course make this a little bit more complicated. So, so these distribution centers also need to order their stuff. This is what we could then call vendor ordering. Uh, and you know this propagates down the graph essentially. So if you want to look at it this way, it's essentially something like a graph max flow optimization problem. But you know, it's, in reality, it's of course a little bit more complex and the graph can have, well, arbitrarily edges. And every edge you can see here in this very simple <laughs> depiction, every graph is essentially an order. So either a machine or actually an actual human needs to order stuff from another location from a distribution center vendor and so on. And the stuff needs to put, be put on a truck because eventually it needs to arrive at the destination. And all of this um, is essentially supply chain management. Um, so um, we can look at this as one huge problem and uh, to get it 100% correct, that's probably true, but uh, we'd like to look, or we try to break this a little bit up into pieces. Uh, namely there are for us, conceptually speaking, four important parts of the pipeline. And this is then also how our say, services we provide are um, outlined. So the first thing, and this starts essentially at the bottom of these graphs is we actually need to know what people are going to buy. What is the demand? So um, 
take into account something like weather. If the weather is great, people want to do barbecue, so we need to stock up on meat. Um, if the, I don't know, football season begins, uh, your supply is, is high in demand. And there are, of course, all of these very, very subtle effects, which are actually a machine learning problem, where we need to, um, or a machine learning time series forecast, if you will. And, but this is only, you know, the first step of its journey. The second thing is then we need to feed these forecasts into an optimizer because in the end, um, just knowing what the demand will be is, you know, not solving any problem. We need hard decisions. We need to know or tell our customers, you need to order now five crates of uh, milk. Otherwise you will go out of stock. So this is an optimization problem. And as I said, there will be ordering involved where even human interaction comes into play. And eventually we need to put everything on trucks and get, get everything out of the door. So breaking this huge problem into pieces helps us to provide services to our customers, but also you know, not to get insane because uh, computationally speaking, this is, I'm not even sure if the entire problem can be solved uh, you know, in, in, in a reasonable amount of time. And if we look at the entire thing, um, and this makes the entire supply chain so complex, uh, this is an ongoing machine. Um, if you, for instance, order something, the truck will maybe arrive two days later, maybe a week later. So this, there, there's, there are lead times involved. So this needs to be accounted so we cannot just isolate this problem, but we can still look at these chunks. But the point is there are a lot of feedback loops, loops involved, um, which makes this a highly non-trivial problem. But um, since we want to, you know, start somewhere today because we cannot solve everything at once. As I said, we need to break stuff into pieces. We want to start at the very beginning. So how do we get machine learning data um, or how do we actually do machine learning? And uh, for this, just to give you a little bit of an impression of what we are dealing with, um, if we look at say a mid-sized customer um, and by mid-sized, uh, globally speaking, that's maybe someone who provides uh, German, uh, has stores only in Germany or the UK, something like this. Uh, that boils down to about 20,000 active products. So that's everything from a chewing gum to a, I don't know, moon law, um, um, any, everything you can buy. And that's essentially, these are 10 million time series for this um, single customer. And these for these 10 million time series, we need to time series forecast, we need optimization and so on and so forth. And if we look at this, we have about 10 years of history for these customers which are about 40 terabytes of data, uncompressed, denormalized. This is the ballpark we're dealing with. Um, and this is a huge engineering problem, a data engineering problem, problem. And that's essentially the data flow we want to look at today. Uh, customer submits data to us. We store this in a, um, say, relational database because, as I said, this graph, this, this supply chain is incredibly complex. This, um, we require about 70 entities, so think of database tables to actually um, express what's ongoing and this is still only an approximation. So this is essentially the customer data set, uh, customer data. And then, you know, before machine learning starts, we need to enrich this data with uh, stuff we know, for instance, with weather data or regional events, stuff like this. And ultimately, of course, feature processing. And this will then end up in a huge, actually, parquet data set. And from this, our journey starts. We use this data set to uh, generate forecasts, we store the forecasts in a data set, and either the customer downloads these predictions immediately, or this is just fed into the next step of our, say, data supply chain. Um, the big problem we are facing here is we have this, so these, these brownish blobs, they are stored in a database. And this comes with uh, cost attached, not only in terms of complexity, but are actually, um, you know, dollars. So um, what we have here for for customer of that size, we require about um, well one and a half terabytes of RAM, um, multiple terabytes of, of actual data storage, hundreds of CPUs just to you know deal with this um, data ingestion and you know joining these seventy entities together to one consistent view because. Um, well, I'm not the machine learning expert, but as far as I know, you cannot do machine learning on 70, um, you know, relational tables. That just doesn't work. So we need to crunch this together and ideally in a way which is cheap, store cheap and in a way that data scientists can, can scale out. And this is where then DAS comes in. Yeah, 
So if there are questions to this topic, we can maybe pause here. Otherwise, I would essentially jump into a little bit of, uh, you know, code. Let, let's jump in in a second. I've, I, that was wonderfully comprehensive, Florian. I, um, I'm interested in, in, in two things. First, um, do, you, do you use Dask, and we'll see this, but maybe a bit of a teaser, do you use Dask at most steps throughout this process? Yeah, so um, as I said, this first, say, data ingestion when the customer submits data to us, this is, um, this is actually, a, this is not connected to Dask, this is a web service, which is then hooked into a database. But everything after this is essentially exclusively powered by Dask. Um, for this machine learning part, we of course have other areas in the company which work a little bit differently. But yes, we use Dask. Essentially, we we start with a parquet data set, and uh, the Dask clusters then use these parquet data sets, do number crunching, store their results in other data sets, maybe join these data sets. Um, and for all of this, we are using Dask. And this also explains why we have so many clusters of those. Because mm -hmm. if we you know I wrote their customer follow-up service because sometimes the customer just downloads this, this, this data. That's not a task problem. Uh, but if there is, for instance, the machine learning um, coming in or the optimization, um, they need to scale out again. They need a few hundred CPUs, a few hundred workers. And um, these are all steps we, we are doing with task. Awesome. I had one other, it's slightly unrelated to this. When you went through the entire process, you talked about um, the network optimization and my, I, I was just curious, what, what, are you, what are you specifically optimizing for there? Yeah, so um, this is also there are different layers to this entire thing. So we usually start with looking at individual stores. So think about um, um, there's certain cost attached to say having too much stock, um, especially if you look at fresh, fresh um, food. Uh, if you have too much vegetable, which is not sold, you have to throw it away. So you want to keep your stock level at a minimum and this, uh, but you want to have everything in stock such that people can buy everything. Otherwise you lose um, revenue. So you can actually express this as a cost optimization problem where, sent, where we have a cost function with different terms. And this out of stock and waste, these are two terms we, we put into our optimizer. There are others, something like um, um, one customer told us about there is a certain uh, psychological pressure involved that if the, um, you know, if there's a lot in stock, people want to buy more. So they have some strategic options to, you know, just increase um, the offering. And there mm -hmm. are other strategic parameters which flow into this um, optimization. And this essentially tells us then, okay, this location needs five crates of milk. And then we propagate this up to the DC because the DC has also its own stock. It has maybe um, deliveries incoming from, from the vendors and so on and so forth. So. Um, this is then a similar optimization. Uh, but with the loft, um, and yeah, that's, that's it. So in, in the end, we try to make this cost driven, strategic driven, because also customers want to control this. Uh, a lot of customers were afraid initially that, you know, we take all of the control. But um, these strategic parameters are essentially what, what flows into this optimization, including the forecast, obviously. And um, yeah, that, that's the, the optimization. Awesome. And then, of How's course, it? you know, how much uh, stuff this can be packed on a truck and so on. But, yeah. Exactly. I feel like you gave a good sense of the optimization there without giving away too many trade secrets as well. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'd love to jump into the code. I'm just wondering if James has any, any questions before we dive Dive deep. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. I'm, I'm a little hesitant to ask just because it maybe is uh, slightly out of scope, but um, so you're, you're talking about this machine learning step um, and, and things like customer yeah. demand. I imagine COVID has, has impacted the, those models. Um, how are your machine learning, you know, how, how, are, how are your machine learning engineers doing these days? Are they, are they hanging in there? Yeah, so when COVID hit us, this was a huge deal because um, mm -hmm. our customers are hugely affected by this. Yeah. And I must admit our machine learning models, you know, cannot or cannot easily cope with this drastic change of, of demand and supply. Um, so essentially what happened, task force, task forces who looked at the problem. And by now we have different models in production which cope with this better. Um, 
but yeah, details, uh, I, I can talk about details. I was not involved in this. I, I personally would be super excited if we, once this all blows over, um, may, I don't know, share a blog post about how, how this all evolved, but I'm not sure you know, how, how feasible this is. But I think there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. Of course, we need to you know, take an eye on um, what kind of data can we actually share and which not. And of course, this is, of course, all, a lot of customer data is confidential, but I think there are lessons learned, which are interesting for other people as well. Yeah, but uh, here, for example, the, the high level of automation helped a lot because, I mean, if you, yes. if you need a hot fix in the processes from day one to day two, it's easy if you have the automation, you just change some automated processes and then you're good to go. Other companies with lower levels of automation had many, many troubles because they need to change how they send over XML and Excel files and so on. So, uh, I mean, that helped a lot that just the level of automation is very high. Yes. And of course, there are also, you know, um, features we provide where they can override certain decisions or forecasts so getting can, or the strategic parameters I mentioned, they could essentially just tune, okay, Toilet paper is now high in demand, so our strategy is to keep it in stock as, as much as possible. So these kind of things helped a lot. Um, and I think we also had some, say, individual things where we just used machine learning to help individual customers, but nothing like a, a product or something like this. Great. Well, let's let's jump in. I was also waiting for one of us to mention toilet paper, so I'm glad we, we got that <laughs> out of the way this year. Um, yeah. Cool. Let's do it. All right, so um, big question. As I said, we, we get this data from the customer, we put it into a database, and um, this is the boring part. This is the expensive part. This is not what a data scientist wants to deal with. So the first question we want to solve or ask right now is, how do we get this data out of that database? How do we get this into a format where we can actually work with it, scale out with it, and so on and so forth? So as, again, I stick to, to some, say, say data numbers, month of data for a customer I mentioned is about 100 gig in pandas. Of course, you can use categoricals and yada yada, um, but that's the ballpark we are dealing with, so we need to split this up. And I assume, uh, you know, watchers are familiar with how Dask works in principle, but uh, in the end, it is very simple to, you know, this, this example suggests we need to split by, by, by dates or something like this. But it turns out that um, this is not sufficient because um, every single date that's, that's not well, well in line with what we want to do, and um, it might even be too much data. So we need to split this up a little bit further. And this is essentially our, the journey we want to look into. Um, and what we are essentially following is more or less the suggestion of Dask. So how do we um, actually construct a Dask data frame from an SQL statement? So this is literally the example which is pasted um, or provided in the documentation. Um, and if we in, look at this, there are, or I see five ingredients, um, a connection, and for us, connections need to be fast, data submission needs to be fast and so on. Uh, we have, of course, SQL, and this is a topic we won't go into any detail. This is just, you know, thousand lines, thousands of lines of code for, for SQL to join all of this. So just assume it is there. Um, schema, okay, and then the partitioning. And last but not least, and I can't stress this enough, how not to kill your database, because if you have Dask and you have 200 workers, not every worker can connect to the database at the same time, unless you have you know, some incredible database I'm not familiar with, but usually you need to somehow limit this, otherwise database is going to die. Um, so these are the five things we want to look at, at a few of those a little bit more closely. Um, and others not so much. Uh, the first thing, establishing connection is more or less a little bit of advertising. Um, what we are using is, is TurboDBC. So TurboDBC is a, it's also an open source library we, we uh, maintain. And in a nutshell, it's uh, about an order of magnitude faster than ordinary ODBC drivers in Python. Um, so if you are dealing with these kind of problems, I definitely recommend uh, to check this out. Um, it's not working. Um, you know, this performance gain is not for every database, but it is incredibly useful and we can, could not live without it, to be honest. Um, and this is just an example on, you know, how to, um, 
how to use TurboDBC. So there's a little bit of boilerplate code involved, but there are open issues in Pandas, for instance, to make this a little bit uh, more accessible. Because Pandas, as you might know, also offers this read SQL or read SQL table statement, which uses SQL Alchemy in the background. Um, there are currently, you know, processes uh, moving to open this up a little bit to move to use something like this. So uh, for the sake of this uh, presentation, let's just assume this is a done deal. The SQL query, this is also something, you know, imagine 7,000 lines of SQL here, and then we are in the ballpark of what we are dealing with. Of course, automatically generated, not put in uh, manually, but this is, again, um, as I said, a very complex problem. Uh, but the result of this query will then be something like a data frame with, I don't know, 50, 60 columns, fields. Some are important for machine learning, some are important for UI or KPI analysis. So this is just a lot of data. The important bit here is, of course, you need to write your data, your, your, your query in a way that you can actually, you know, download subsets of it, chunks. And the way we do this usually is we, we slice by, by um, time dimension and by something, a partition ID, something a logical cluster where we just group certain um, uh, data together. And this is something we can uh, have a look at. Uh, so so a quick question, you, you mentioned you get 50 to 60 features or co columns um, in general, like what order of magnitude, number of rows or, or data points are we talking about? Um, right, rows, I would, argue i have later an example and i think i have a hundred okay these are only a hundred million rows i guess a hundred million is uh, this is actually something i should have looked up i think the output we generate so the predictions we put out are in the order of billions a day okay um that that's the ballpark as i said we have um about 10 million um time series and if you forecast for say three weeks or for some customers, we even forecast an entire year, you can, uh, you know, 20, 20 million time, times a hundred, that's, that's the ballpark. Yeah, so that's, I, I love you that's, signal when you said, oh, in some cases it's only a hundred million. So the fact that sometimes <laughs> it's only a hundred million gives me an idea of what, what ballpark yeah, is. A hundred million is nothing. That's, that's, uh, that's something I would argue you don't even need ask for but mm -hmm. um, that, 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 that depends but yeah the problem is we need to you know split this up eventually and um, this is uh, what we call here partition internally we also call this logical cluster um, so we somehow want to you know chunk data together which actually belongs somehow together from a business perspective and one one way to do this and I can um, tell you we tried a lot we tried I, at some point, I wrote an SQL statement which calculated time series feature autocorrelation and stuff to classify this. But in the end, it's much simpler to stick to what we have. And for what we have in this business domain, um, we have products, and these products are in a hierarchical grouping, uh, product groups. Um, and these can be, you know, this, this shows a very simple example of three, three hierarchy levels. Uh, some customers have three, some have eight or 10. So this depends, but in, this is something essentially all retailers have in common. Um, also for say internal bookkeeping. And I annotated these, these graphs with, with some, some numbers because if we just you know, perform something like a row count, so how many products do I have in fresh milk? Um, then I get a number. And in, in the end, I have something like a weighted tree. Um, and um, in the end, finding these partitions is then essentially figuring out where do I need to cut my tree such that in the end, everything is more or less homogeneous. Um, this is essentially the very, very first step we need to do once we have data, because otherwise we cannot really deal with it, at least not in a machine learning fashion, not with Dask and so on and so forth. So for this, uh, for, for this presentation, I actually used this very, very simple example. And as you can see, okay, in this example, um, I have maybe two of these product groups, the milk in one partition ID and the others in, in some others. Uh, of course, these are usually much, much you know, larger. I think for, for customers of that size, we have about 3000 of these logical clusters um, plus the dates split because otherwise 
we, we just can't use Dask. Of course, what you should not forget is um, these, these individual partitions of, of, of a Dask worker, for instance, they should not, even though you have maybe eight or, or 16 gigabyte pods, you should not have 16 gigabyte of data in there because you want to actually do something with it. So splitting it up, you know, in small manageable pieces is important. Um, yeah, and this is essentially the grunt work we need to do. This is say, um, say some pre-processing we need to perform and everything, once this is done, everything else is essentially um, task. And for this, uh, later I'm, I'm going to show this on our actual infrastructure with a little bit of more data. But for this example, I'm just using the task local cluster. So I'm just starting a client here. Um, there is also the dashboard. Um, I haven't set this up properly with the Jupyter extension. That would have been great, but um, it will work either way. So this function we will not look into. This is just, you know, generate some garbage um, to resemble what we are actually dealing with. Uh, <laughs> right. Is that you know it's live? Yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> so for, the, for this example, I, I keep it simple. As I said, we are not using 50, 50 columns in here. And also note these 50 columns I was mentioning or how many they actually are. This is just raw customer input. Um, there is no you know, processing or actual feature building on top of this. Um, I think last time I spoke with our machine learning engineers, they had hundreds of those. And then you know, some, some um, influence selection where they sent, I, I don't know. I, I'm not the, the perfect guy here to ask, but there are a lot of more involved. This is just, I'm still talking only about raw, raw input. And there are some, some important things in here, something like price, sales, stocks, and our product hierarchy level. So I have now this function. I can have, I can query essentially by partition ID. I can tell them I want a week of data and so on and so forth. And this is everything I more or less need to um, um, well, build my DAS data frame. So I just tell it how much data I want to have. And in the end, I can take the example um, from the ask itself, and we have a lot more, you know, blue code around it. But in a nutshell, points boils down to this, where I can just create my job list, call my download, whatever function, and be done with it. And the last ingredient I mentioned is, please don't kill your database. And this essentially is about, yeah, um, rate limiting, connection limiting. So we must ensure that not more than 20, 40, 60, depending on the database cluster, not, not more than that uh, actually connects to it. And uh, we were faced with this problem when migrating from our internal um, scheduler engine to Dask. And um, this is where we contributed the um, semaphore, which is currently in distributed, which does exactly this. So I can essentially configure a, a maximum amount of connections, if you will, um, on my database. So you can also have multiple of those. And then you would just throw it into your delayed function and have this context manager. And this ensures then that only in this case, two workers simultaneously can connect to your database. Um, but this is still, you know, the, the question might be, okay, if, if the limit is at 20, why not use just 20 workers? And this is more or less easily answered um, because Sometimes I want to do more with the data once uh, when I have memory. Sometimes I want to do maybe some very simple, trivial um, pre-processing uh, pre with the whole thing, uh, which happens after the download. And this is important. Uh, I can have maybe a hundred workers and they are all busy, but only maybe 20 are actually connecting to the database. But of course it depends on you know, what, what are you, you are actually doing, but this gives you a handle on this um, duality between um, I/O limiting and CPU limiting, um, or depending on what where your say um, bottleneck is. I just want to so really this, put on my gas gas cool. maintainer's hat and uh, thank Florian and all of his colleagues at uh, Blue Yonder for like first off contributing the Sim4 implementation and also kind of owning and maintaining that. So thank you very much, Florian. Uh, thank you very much, Lucas. Everyone else who's been working on that. 
Um, sure, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's really it's cool to see it in, in use happen. also. Because uh, yeah. I, I just see all the, the PRs that happen. This is, this is yeah. it's good to see it in action. Yes. Yeah, this, this implementation was also not that trivial because we have, as I said, we have 200 workers in production, uh, clusters in production. So we need this to actually work. So um, <laughs> for instance, the problem yeah. we needed to solve, if a worker dies before it can resubmit to the scheduler, hey, I'm, I'm done, what do we do? Uh, because this, this creates deadlocks, this creates bottlenecks. So this whole thing needed to be resilient. And this is, this is I, I'm showing here a very simple problem, but in the background, it's of course incredibly complex. And this is what say most of our engineering efforts come into play. Dask offers us here a very nice API to do this, but um, the messy pieces are behind the scenes. And this is also good. Once once fixed, fixed once, that, that's fixed once and for all. Um, that's also what I like about Dask. Um, yeah. Anyhow, so I have this database connection now. I apply some post-processing, uh, maybe some quality checks um, or some feature engineering. And yes, uh, the square of sales is not a good feature, but for the sake of the of the demonstration, I essentially now have a arguably tiny, but I have a Dask data frame which works as expected. So on the right-hand side, you can see the task dashboard um, and I can do fancy stuff with this. Also a little bit more fancy stuff than the sum. Uh, what you can see here in the task graph is also essentially the semaphore in, in, in action. So you can see that only two of these, um, uh, you know, yellow blocks evolve at a time because two connect to the database, they are done with their computation, they free the lease and the next one can, can continue. And in a realistic scenario, these very, very narrow uh, bluish um, computations. These are then the feature um, processing uh, things or maybe even machine learning or, or, or optimized. So this is, sometimes this is incredibly heavy computation in there such that this IO is, is negligible. Um, and this is where, where this whole semaphore comes to play. But I, um, so as we can see here already, this takes 3.3 seconds because I put in an arbitrary sleep command. This is, this is the database has a certain lag and this is where the whole persistence thing comes into play. So this is not how we want to, you know, we want data, uh, data scientists to interact with this data because they will kill the database eventually, no matter whether we have a semaphore or not in place. So this is more or less a very closely controlled job we have. This this job which extracts the data um, in an automated fashion. So how do I get this final um, augmented uh, data set into play uh, or in a persistent play on? And this is where a library comes, comes in, which we also open sourced, which is called Kartotek. Uh, very hard to pronounce, I know, uh, but this is essentially a, a um, storage layer for parquet data sets. So if you have uh, huge parquet data sets and you need more control over how they are produced, how they are managed, what kind of, you know, additional metadata information they store in. This is where this comes into play. And for this demonstration, I um, can just, you know, use my local store. This, we also have this abstraction that we can essentially have store URLs in here. Uh, in, in a realistic scenario, I'm actually using an, a cloud blob store. So in our instance, we are operating on Azure, that's the Azure blob store. But if you are on S3 uh, on Amazon, that would be S3 or it would be cloud storage or I don't know, Dropbox for all I care. Um, that's, that's the idea. You have a very simple key value store and you can store your data in there. And while this does not look really straightforward, we can you know look into it. There's data set UID, which is essentially the name of the entire thing. I called it augmented data set because in a realistic scenario, this is not just customer data. There's also data enrichment ongoing weather data, event data, feature processing, and so on and so forth. And, and, and hopefully the, the viewer's mental model, this is kind of like a uh, czar or HDF store, but for tabular data instead of ND arrays, right? Exactly. So Great. Um, this is this is equivalent to, to SAR for, for Dask data frame, if you will. Um, if you are familiar with um, Hive tables, that's essentially it, just with a little bit of, of management on top. And we will see this also in a second. And we can essentially dump this DAS data frame into one of our APIs. We tell it where to store it. We tell it how it is called. And then we can apply some, some 
um, sugar on top of it. Uh, we can control the way the partitions should look like, and we can build indices. Uh, for now, forget about these indices. Uh, we will look at these in a second. But um, once I store this, um, the ask crunches its numbers. And you can again see that the semaphore is doing its job. Otherwise, this would probably be much faster. And what's falling out of this is this data set metadata object, uh, where we have partition keys, uh, schema versioning, we have, and we have these indices. And in fact, if you look at the actual storage keys, um, that's just it. That's uh, there. There's some some cardiotech specifics up here where we store our data. And otherwise, these are just plain and simple files. We use Parquet, and I can definitely recommend not to do anything else. But if you are less familiar with Parquet, imagine this to be a CSV file. Um, but I definitely don't, don't recommend using CSV. Um, so this is in my local store, so I can also just browse this data set. And that's that's just it. So, so Kabotek does nothing more than storing this. This is also very, very similar to what Dask does. There is this Dask to Parquet um, call, which does a very, very, very similar thing. But this, this um, metadata we store on top of this, this is actually extremely, extremely valuable. And why this is, we, we will, um, well, investigate a bit. So for instance, one, one bit of the metadata we store is, so this augmented data set thing, this is the essentially kind of take representation of this data set. We reference every single file explicitly. This gives two, two, or the two major advantages here are, we definitely know what our data is. Nobody can just put stuff in there and you know act as if it was there. This is important for failure scenarios. For instance, if workers die while they have written uh, data, but um, maybe they run twice, and then all of a sudden you have duplicates, or if you actually move on to um, scenarios where you want to mutate this data, even by extending it or deleting stuff, this, this um, storing these explicit references gives you essentially the possibility to perform an atomic commit. And this is also, again, for our automation pipelines, extremely important that we can rely on this data. It is consistent. Updates are always atomic. Um, this is an extremely valuable. Um, and of course, there's you know some some schema information. So what kind of data is in there? What kind of fields? What kind of uh, um, what kind of types are in there? Um, that that stuff. But this is something Dask offers you as well. This is just um, one representation. And if you are familiar with this kind of representation, this is Arrow. So uh, in the background, we are of course using uh, Apache Arrow and Parquet. But um, we are trying very hard that the users do not uh, need to know this explicitly because sometimes it's messy. But um, as I promised, this is similar to what Dask is doing. So I can actually also read the data in Dask. So this ensures a certain compatibility. If you do not want to lock in, uh, get locked into Kartik, that's fine. But uh, I strongly advise you to use the Kartik API, uh, which is a little bit more verbose, but um, well, in the end, it's just a function name. And in the end, I get similar data frames, not identical. But um, that's that's just down to the implementation details. But it's the same data, so I have uh, the same amount of sales, the same number of files, and so on and so forth. Now um, indices. I, I, I teased this already. We we have kind of a technique to index our data. Um, in this particular example, I built indices on these these product groups, for instance, and on, on the week partition ID date, and so on and so forth. And um, to show you how this looks like. I can, for instance, I'm interested in all rows with larger than 0.5 sales. I have the syntax, which we call predicates, and it is not as convenient as, as the Dask um, um, data frame thing, but um, maybe eventually we're getting, we're, we're getting there. But essentially, this will filter your data. Um, and so far, nothing, nothing um, you know, important happened. Um, we have 24 partitions. I'm, I'm filtering on some unknown column. Um, it will be filtered. So I will have um, few, only the rows in there which are actually um, belonging to that filter. Um, I can calculate this. I can visualize this. And in the end, I need to load the entire data frame. That's, that's expected. I'm filtering on something which I don't know anything in advance about. 
So I need to load the entire data frame. That's slow, obviously. I need to touch, I don't know, 100,000 files instead of one. Now I dive deeper into, um, say, a, a weak um, filtering. And if we jump briefly up ahead, uh, up above again, weak is something which is called, uh, that there's this partition concept where you can actually encode this stuff into, in, into the file names. This is how Hive essentially operates. This is also how Dask operates. And you can, of course, filter on this. And um, what happens then is if I use something like this, all of a sudden, I do not need to load um, all of the files, but you know, only those who are um, actually re uh, responsible for, for my query. So in fact, I have a much smaller graph. Much smaller graph means usually much, much faster execution. That's really, that's great to see. I have a quick question about the, um... I so, guess the limitations and what kind of data types you can encode in the file name. Like for instance, if you if you had like a date time object or something like that. Yes. Um, I would Im imagine that'd be more difficult. Um, but maybe it is. And um, to be honest, the only reason why I even um, or why we even implemented this partition key encoding is just for compatibility. This is what Dask does. This is what Spark does. This is what a Hive table looks like. And there are a lot of tools out there which can just ingest this Hive-like table structure. And it yeah. looks simple for, especially in my example, I'm using integers and um, yeah, just integers. That's an easy thing. Mm -hmm. Date times are a little bit more tricky. Uh, what's even more tricky is um, actually string types because you have arbitrary characters in there and your blob store might you know, not support all of the symbols. Mm -hmm. Especially for instance, uh, forward slashes. This is something we use for, for yes. For our internal bookkeeping. So uh, what actually happens is that we apply URL encoding to whatever comes in. So we um, parse, for instance, a date time, we rep represent it in an ESO calendar representation, and then URL encode it, and so on and so forth. But this is also, um, to be honest, a huge um, uh, pain in, well, this is something I would actually like to get rid of, but um, for compatibility reasons, that's just invaluable. And it Great. also makes sure. things sure. slow um, because I need to parse all of this stuff. Uh, string parsing in Python is weird. So there come a lot of reasons. And especially if I you know, have my indices, if I have all this bookkeeping, I do not need this encoding anymore. So if you want to be super fast, don't bother with partition keys anymore. Just use you know, this plain, plain data types and, and use, um, um, use indices. That's, that's mm -hmm. my, 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 my message here. But um, then you break compatibility to other tools. That's, that's, that's uh, the shortcoming here. But yeah, um, I was here a week equals one. That, that reduces already my, my workload. But this is not magic. This is also something Cardo take, uh, Dask can do and Hive and so on. I could essentially just grab my, my file names and have the same um, partition pruning, which how this is called. Uh, but I can also, for instance, I have this column indexed. And um, as it turns out, milk is only in milk in uh, with sales larger than 0.5 in week one is only in a single file. And this, of course, um, gives me a very straightforward graph. So if I run an optimizer on this, this is essentially one single task, one interaction with the store. And I have immediately, without any network computation or uh, network communication, I have my results. And this is, of course, incredibly powerful um, concept. So, of course, in, with this kind of data, it's it's not so much. But um, once we move to terabyte scale, this is this is well invaluable. Yeah. So so these are the indices, and usually, um, maybe, maybe um, we we we'll, we'll stay here for a second. It might um, be good to move on. We've got around 10 minutes left and I don't want to make sure we get to the machine sure, learning. I'm, I'm almost through. Sure. Um, the, the good thing here is uh, the creator needs to take care of how this is written. So users do not need to bother with this. Users do not need right. to care about what kind of indices they, they actually need to control or load. This is all done behind the scenes. But okay, we have 10 minutes left, so I will, I will speed up. Um, we have these indices. And I will tease this in a, in a minute. Um, we can do fancy stuff with these indices once we have multiple data sets. 
um, but I will just skip over this. One important thing for us is how do we get more data into this? And for the sake of the time, I can just append this kind of data. I can update my data set. This is not an immutable thing. And I can actually update this um, consistently with one atomic operation. So if, if something during this update fails, uh, my data set is still consistent. Again, hooking into automation and so on and so forth, extremely valuable feature. Now, um, machine learning. This is what all of this is about, right? Um, we are still staying with Kartotek. And in this example, I'm not fitting anything. We just assume there is something magical. And uh, we have essentially a very simple function, which is called generate predictions. In this example, I generate random predictions. I maybe add a timestamp for, for you know, data lineage. And maybe I have even a classifier, something like this. Um, and what Kartotek can also give me is something we call a dispatch by which then ensures that all data belonging to this particular field is actually in the job. And this is then where the machine learning comes in that we can essentially map our machine learning experts, so matrices, whatever we have there to these partition IDs. And in the end, it is a very, say, um, straightforward job. And most of what we do is then embarrassingly parallel, um, which is great. And of course, what we do once we have these predictions at, at this point in time, it's also just a dust data frame. I'll just store them again as a Kartotek data set. I can maybe build other indices on my predictions. For instance, on this classifier I, I was building um, and data scientists can then browse these um, say prediction tables, however they want. And then just a teaser, uh, what we can do with um, you know, these indices Let's assume I want to investigate everything with classifier true, um, but want to you know, cross reference this to the initial input data set, then I all of a sudden to join this whole thing. But there's only one runtime error. There's only one uh, actual file where this uh, data is in. And uh, knowing this, in, a, uh, knowing this in, in advance, I can actually more, more or less simplify the join between multiple data sets. So I know which files I need to load on the left side, I know which files I need to load on the right side, and then I smash everything together. Um, since this is a very complicated topic, um, we end time is running out. I just um, hint you, we have some functionality around this also as part of Kartotek. Um, and a lot of our pipelines are just using this. Uh, it's called cubes, Kartotek cubes, uh, with a reference to data cubes, hypercubes, because um, you know, dimensionality of data comes into play here. Um, if you're interested or have similar problems like these, uh, check out, check this out. We have a blog post of this on our um, Briano Tech, Tech uh, blog, and there's of course a documentation. All right, so um, at this point, since we are running out of time, maybe the very last thing I want to show is just prove to you this is a real thing. We actually do this on, on big data. Um, what you can or should be able to see right now is essentially our um, um, platform portal. And for this uh, example, I set up a distributed cluster. It's currently running on you know, one worker because we use dynamic scaling here. So if there is no load on this entire thing, we do not spin up the workers, otherwise it costs money. So as you can see, if I get everything I have, it's quite expensive, otherwise not. And I have a Jupyter notebook. And from this Jupyter notebook, I can connect to my DAS cluster. I can connect to a store and um, maybe I restart this. And this time I'm not actually working on a um, file store. This is uh, an actual blob store. This is, um, this is in the cloud uh, once the Jupyter notebook gets up and running here, yeah. right? So I have these data sets and I probably just skip ahead I, I built one of these data sets. I want to show you, okay, what the impact is between indexed and non-indexed. So I have multiples of these, but uh, let's just um, look at one example. We have this um, indexed augmented data set, indexed um, three. <laughs> I just put this together before this, um, this call. And what I can then do is essentially with predicates and without predicates, evaluate this entire thing and yeah, we, we should be able to see exactly this, that um, the um, amount of data we actually need to load is 
much, much smaller. But um, if there are any questions while I get this up and running, uh, think of it or ask away, um, and I try to get something up. So we haven't had any questions about this this part in in particular yet, and I think that's you know testament to how comprehensive you've you, you've actually been. Um, I have a few questions actually. Um, uh, yeah. So. Um, in the notebooks you've shown, um, it looks like uh, you're using basically data frame and delete. I was just curious what kind of parts of Dask you're touching. You're obviously touching the distributed scheduler and the semaphore there as well, but yes. mostly dealing with delayed and data frame? Um, we are also quite fond of the bags because for, yes. these, for these, say, custom graphs, which are at least a priori embarrassing parallel, uh, the mm -hmm. bags are offering a very um, user-friendly API. So um, often we don't actually use delayed objects, but actually bags, because they also come with an optimizer and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. That's right. Yeah, I forgot you guys had, you've uh, helped us improve the optimizer for bags. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I was looking through the card tech documentation yesterday and um, saw that this is kind of a, a small usability question. I saw that the all the prefixes have an H in front of them. I was wondering why that was like, instead of having S3 colon slash slash, yes, 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 H, yes. S3. What, what, why, what's the H? Uh, the H is essential. So we are using um, simple KV, which is more or less a very simple um, abstraction for key value stores. And there was essentially an argument with the initial creator about whether forward slashes are actually allowed um, values in, um, in, in storages. So the original implementation forbids this and the H essentially unlocks an, uh, an extended key space where more or less everything is allowed. That's, really that's the whole magic behind it. Much, much it's folder then, right? Once you have a slash yes, yes. and it's interpreted as a folder, for example, in yes. the Azure Storage Explorer, once you have a slash, it's like a folder. Yes. So, and this means that hierarchical blob yeah. storage files. It's like a file system then. Yes. Mm -hmm. That was also the argument that the plain key value store should not have a hierarchical folder like structure. Um, but, you know, we can deal with it. Ah, uh, yeah, but uh, if this is not. Um, I, I, all right. So. Okay, so, so in, in effect, what I wanted to show you here is, is the same thing we have otherwise as well. We have, we have our. Um, huge distributed clusters. Um, in this case, it's only one worker. Um, it will take a minute to spin up, but essentially this now processes a data frame with a few thousand um, partition keys. And obviously if I do this on an indexed column, um, this is much faster. This is the whole point. This is now an operation where I essentially load everything without any um, indices. If I just stop this, um, Oops. It becomes it, it should become much faster because I need to touch much much fewer data, and this then allows more or less uh, interactive data um, visualization of uh, for for data scientists that they can just um, um, play around with these um, and um, you know scale out. Very cool to see. So oh, nice, you guys this also awesome. set up as well. Yes, yes. So, so yeah, what's happening this... here? <laughs> All right. So this is our. That, um... That's Grafana, Hugo. Yeah. So this is our platform portal, and um, one one big thing is uh, that we have Grafana here. So we expose a lot of Prometheus metrics in Dask, and we essentially have these dashboards which show some internals. Um, so if we look at the current computation, which is running um, on the bottom, uh, at the top left side, we can actually see what tasks are in the scheduler. This gives us more or less a feeling about progress, an easy entrance there, maybe even some alerting there. We have CPU distribution over all workers, memory distributions. Um, on this right-hand side here, we can see how scaling works. So now the scheduler says our cluster manager, hey, 
I would like to have at least 19 workers. Um, it will take a minute to pick up, but this is more or less our observability um, into the system. And without this, um, so this, this offers much uh, more value or much more detailed view on, on the entire thing that what the, um, the actual bokeh dashboard um, offers. I'm also, also interested yes. in what the sus suspicious tasks are. Ah, yeah. The suspicious tasks are actually something. Um, if, a, for instance, a worker dies, which mm. happens, pots fail or, even, or goes out of memory even, um, it is automatically rescheduled by the cluster, by, by the task scheduler. But um, to not, you know, to eventually abort rescheduling, it has essentially a retry counter or a suspicious counter. So um, depending on how it is configured, if a task is maybe five times flagged as suspicious, the entire graph is uh, aborted. And mm -hmm. this is important for us um, to know because um, if, you know, this happens very often, this might hint at a systemic issue. Makes sense. So we're gonna to have to wrap up in a couple of minutes. Yep. How would you how would you like to are there any final words or anything you'd like to like to do to wrap up? Um I, I guess not. So if you are interested in, in this kind of thing or are facing similar problems, I would be really happy to to hear about this. I know of a few users of Cardotech outside of our company. Um, if you are using it or are interested in it. Uh, just uh, approach us on, on GitHub or um, I'm not sure Sebi, if we have any any other um, ways of, of communication, but if you're interested in that kind of thing, um, try to reach out to us and, and we'll make it work. Fantastic. Well, I'd love to thank everyone who joined today. I'd love to thank James for co-hosting. I'd love to thank our wonderful guests, Florian and, and Sebastian, for showing all, all, all their super interesting work. Sure. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yeah,